From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Just ahead this morning, grieving Bozeman family members tell us what they hope will continue after the death of a man in that hardened pylon. I'm Ashley Nervovig in Helena, and coming up, the Montana GOP's new party platform and priorities for next legislative session. Oh, and some new drastic video from Yellowstone National Park showing the ferocity of the floods that hit there in June. That video is spectacular. See if you haven't seen it. Uh, we're going to show it to you in a moment. Meantime, it is 6.30 on this Thursday. Chet Lehman, Matt Elwell with you here. A lovely start there it on is. our community hospital of Anaconda uh, ICAM in view. It's absolutely stunning yeah. outside. Um, you had that report on Mallard uh, yeah. boat launch on the Yellowstone being closed. There's yeah. also that eight-mile stretch uh, from 89 Bridge to, I believe, it's Sheep Mountain closed. Right, uh, Myers Landing to... Right. Because yep. of the uh, railroad bridge that's, that's right. uh, threatening so, to be in. So, so damage from that changes. flooding is still that's ongoing right. out there, too. Hey, yeah, uh, the morning, it's going to be comfortable. It's going to be beautiful. The temperatures are going to turn pretty hot mm -hmm. for most of us. Again, cloudless skies um, and a little breeze setting up. We are watching the potential of our fire danger climb as we go through the week, probably the weekend as well. Fire weather watches already out. I'm going to break those down for you coming up in just a few minutes. All right, thank you, Matt. 631. In an instant, a family's life changes as a Bozeman man dies in that hardened pileup. Tins Judy Slate has the story of what the last moments were like and what the family wants to see happen as it tries to move on. 60-year-old Eric Love was one of six people who died last Friday in a 21-vehicle pileup on I-90. He's got too much energy and life and vitality for this for this to happen to him. Jen Beeston is the CEO of Crosscut Mountain Sports, which Love founded five years ago as a place for local kids to learn and participate in biathlon. Charisma and energy and let's take a leap and figure it out later. And Love took a leap, raising $8 million to buy the old Bohart Ranch and adjoining property for Crosscut. It was his passion until last Friday. Love and his wife Jackie were on a road trip to Vermont on I-90 by Hardin when the unthinkable happened. All of a sudden it went from blue sky, beautiful weather, to just black and couldn't see anything. And all of a sudden Jackie said there's just this semi right in front of them. And he slammed on the brakes. I think he tried to swerve and it, they just collided. Um, she, she didn't lose consciousness. She was aware and, um, very quickly was just yelling for Eric and, are you okay? Are you alive? Are you okay? Was able to grab his hand, was able to finally make eye contact with him and, um, saw him take his last breath. Jackie remains in the hospital recovering from serious injuries. In a statement, she said, quote, as we grieve this giant hole he leaves in our lives, I can hear him whispering in my ear to rally together and fulfill his vision for Crosscut today and long into the future for the benefit of our entire community. His children, Sabine and Alex Love, issued this statement, quote, he found so much pride and enjoyment out of connecting people with the outdoors through his love for this magical place. It's our hope that his vision continues. And under the family's direction, the Love Crosscut Fund has been established. His strong commitment to our community and wanting to create a way that everybody can connect with nature. In Bozeman, Judy Slate, MTN News. All right, thank you very much, Judy. 633 now. Yellowstone National Park showing some new video from the June flooding event. This in the Lamar Canyon where you can see the depth and speed of erosion. 50 foot tall trees swept into the river literally in an instant. This is now west of the northeast entrance to the park and has caused significant road damage, which must be repaired before winter if access to Silvergate Cook City is to be restored. Other video shows the extent of the damage to the road from Gardner to Mammoth. The park is promising to have the old Gardner Road paved and open before winter snow set in as an alternative to this road, which washed out because of that flooding. 
And the park reopening a bit more access to the Slough Creek area, which was closed after that flooding. Bicycles, hiking and fishing access between Tower Junction and Slough Creek opens today. Those wishing to bike or hike into the area will park at Tower Junction. Those with backcountry permits already have access to that area. And Yellowstone National Park says the fire danger level in the park is now high. No active wildfires in the park, but precautions are now in place to keep fires from starting. Campfires only permitted in established fire rings in campgrounds and a few backcountry sites. Campfires must always be attended, must be cold to the touch before abandoning. Uh, 635 now, party platform. The Montana GOP adopted its party platform at a conference in Billings this weekend, and heated discussion broke out on the topics of abortion, elections, and legislative accountability. TN's Ashley Nurbavig has more. Moderate Republicans failed to temper the Montana Republican Party platform this weekend as the GOP declared, among other far-right principles, that it didn't want an exception for abortion cases involving rape or incest. Rather than saying we support a complete ban on elective abortions, I would urge to say we oppose elective abortions. We support a ban on abortion, correction, on elective abortion, with the exception of cases of rape or incest, or when there exists an imminent threat to the life of the mother. What makes it this language even harder for me is in the case of rape and incest, because I do not believe that the baby should be responsible for the sins of another person. Conservatives met in Billings last week to hammer out the party platform, articulating stances on major issues such as education, taxation, and natural resources. Next session, the platform may also be used to help create a scorecard for legislators, which would keep track of how Republican Montana lawmakers voted on major pieces of legislation. Representative Derek Skies was the champion of his accountability tool. However, proxy delegate Heidi Strager from Butte said the scorecard could stifle people with more moderate beliefs. We don't want to compel people into supporting what they might disagree with. Skies acknowledged that people don't like extreme politics, but the scorecard could be considered a solution. The radical elements are causing a lot of Americans to say we don't want that heavy duty partisan politics. So if we don't want heavy duty partisan politics, what do we want? Then we should govern by principle. That's what everyone's telling me. Both the party and the candidates should label what they stand for and when they get to Helena, follow through on what they told voters they would do, Skies said. Well, when you say let's label what we stand for, wouldn't you say that you stand for the extreme conservative side? No. You I don't think that's extreme at all. You don't think that you were one okay, of the more extreme people? In well, yes, because I'm an unapologetic conservative, yes. <laughs> it's because I don't take any crap. During the about five hours discussing platform language, delegates more than once booed moderate views, while more extreme views drew contempt from even other conservatives such as Representative Bill Mercer, a Billings Republican, who mocked a line in the National Affairs section about January 6 defendants. So it refers to people being held in indefinite detention. Let me quickly say how the criminal justice system works. Mercer, the former U.S. attorney for Montana, described the process of a typical federal criminal case, including how and when people are released from prison. When another delegate got up to rebut Mercer and restated the belief that prosecutors are depriving January 6 defendants of due process, Mercer rolled his eyes. When the topic of how to count ballots arose, Hamilton Republican Representative David Beatty said the unfounded attacks on Montana's election system does nothing but degrade people's confidence in the fundamental process of voting. If we're a conservative party that wants to maintain our institutions, we should quit throwing gasoline on the fire. Thank you. However, Senator Teresa Manzella said her inability to understand the technology involved in voting machines makes it tough to call the process transparent. I can admit that I'm so ignorant about this subject that I don't even know what I don't know, and I think most people fall into that category. In the end, delegates voted to make it a party priority to convert back to a non-digital voting system. In Helena, Ashley Nurbovig, MTN News. All right, 639, the eighth and possible final public January 6th committee hearing will take place tonight in primetime. It gets underway at 8 p.m. Eastern time or 6 p.m. our time. So what are we expecting from the committee tonight? And more importantly, how many people outside of D.C. are actually paying attention? Our Joe St. George went to one of the most competitive House districts in the country for a perspective. New testimony and new evidence is expected in tonight's January 6th committee hearing. 
Of course, the big question for us reporters covering this thing is whether anyone outside of Washington is paying attention to this. To find out, we left the Beltway and headed to Smithfield, Virginia. We didn't just choose this place randomly. This is part of the 2nd Congressional District of Virginia, one of the most competitive House districts in the country. It's the district Representative Elaine Laurier is running for re-election in. She's a Democrat on the January 6th committee and will be leading the hearing tonight. She's running against Republican Jen Kiggins. Off Main Street here, we found Democrats. I did vote for Joe Biden. Republicans. I don't care for Biden. People who are watching. Have you watched all of these hearings or most I've of these hearings? I've watched most of them. And people who are not. So much of it. I have to say was fake news. What we found is pretty consistent with the latest polling from Quinnipiac University. Around 58% of the country are following the hearings closely or somewhat closely. 74% of Democrats are watching this. 51% of Republicans are too. A lot's coming out that the general public did not know. Barbara Bendel told me she will be tuning in. She's a former Donald Trump supporter, but she says these hearings left her disgusted. I've been real disappointed because it shows how a power-hungry president can do so much damage. Over the next table. Things are not what they used to be. Carol Goralsik says it's the witnesses that have kept her watching. She was particularly struck by Cassidy Hutchinson, the young Trump aide who testified the former president knew the rioters were armed and that he encouraged them to go to the Capitol. Yeah, I just felt she was being totally honest. There's no way she could make all that up. Tonight's hearing is expected to provide the most complete account of what former President Trump was doing in the White House while the rioters were breaching the Capitol. He was a very outspoken man. But that won't be enough to get Tim Hersom, who voted for Trump, to tune in. Although he does plan to read news reports after the hearing takes place. So far, though, he hasn't been convinced. I wish someone could stand up for him, but I really don't know how much involvement he had. And then there is Rebecca. I don't know anything about him. You haven't watched it all? No. On purpose. <laughs> she told me she doesn't have time as a mom to devote hours to television. And while she hates to look at the images of January 6th, she says if Donald Trump runs for president again, she may vote for him. If he's the lesser of two evils again, I'm going to vote for him again. These answers are a reminder that in many parts of the country, January 6th isn't the top story. Ultimately, the Department of Justice will decide if anyone, including former President Trump, gets charged with a crime. In Smithfield, Virginia, I'm Joe St. George. All right, 642, we're going to take a break here on Montana's